Hello, my name is Gergana Ivanova. I'm Associate Professor of Japanese Literature and Culture at the University of Cincinnati. As a scholar, I'm interested in the reception history of Heian literature, uh, early modern erotic and didactic literature, and present-day manga representations of the past. I recently published a book titled Unbinding the Pillow Book, The Many Lives of a Japanese Classic that examined uh, the reception history of Makura no Soshi, the pillow book, and my second book project examines the eroticization of Heian women writers in the early modern period. So before trying to answer the question, what is the pillow book, let's look at some editions of the work. Here we have Kitamura Kitin's commentary produced in the 17th century. We have English translations. We have a manga adaptation, a modern Japanese translation edition, uh, another English translation, and here's another volume of Kigen's commentary. As you see, some of them are illustrated, some of them are scholarly editions, and they're quite different. And uh, there are also children's books that focus on just one passage of the pillow book. And they still present it as the pillow book. So readers recognize all these textual manifestations as the pillow book, but they're so all different. So what makes them the pillow book? So the pillow book uh, is a text written most likely at the beginning of the 11th century by a woman known as Seishanagon. But I guess this is all we can tell about the textual manifestation of the work. More importantly, I think it's more productive to think of it as a text that transcends material manifestation and a text that served as an important resource to engage with Japan's past and comment on the present. So readers today within and outside Japan uh, are introduced to the pillow book in the following way. It's a zuihitsu, a miscellany consisting of over 300 passages. The passages uh, have been divided into three types, essays, diary-like entries, and lists. And the author of the pillow book, Seishonagon, is a woman who was boastful, outspoken, and a rival of Murasaki Shikibu, the author of The Tale of Genji. So this may be a convenient way to describe the work, but it's important to keep in mind that every aspect of this definition emerged much later, centuries later, namely from the 17th to the early 20th century. And um, most interpretations of the text and representations of the author that linger in contemporary scholarship and popular culture are a result of these later engagements with the text. So let me give you some examples. The earliest documented attempts to create a unified text of the pillow book based on the multiple versions, the large number actually, of manuscripts and printed books can be dated back to the 17th century. At that time, three scholars created their own authoritative texts, and they used different sets of manuscripts and printed books, and they sectioned the text in different ways, and that resulted in a different number of passages. They rearranged the text so that it made more sense to their own interpretation of what the text was. The pillow book was first labeled a zuihitsu in the 18th century, following centuries of reception as a court tale, a diary, a collection of anecdotes, a work related to poetry, and so on. And all of a sudden, it became a zuihitsu. So Bangkoke, a poet and a writer, uh, created the first Japanese literary history. He labeled the pillow book uh, a zuihitsu because he thought that it didn't fit into any of the genres that were known to people at that time, namely uh, diary, nikki, and court romances, uh, monogatari. And he didn't justify in, like, in any logical way the label. 
and he just moved on. So later scholars used his work to talk about the pillow book as a zuihitsu. The zuihitsu label was applied to the pillow book in the 18th century, and it wasn't logically justified. And scholars continue to use that even nowadays uh, in literary circles, scholarly circles, and popular culture. It's still referred to as zuihitsu, but zuihitsu itself uh, changed over time. And regardless of that, the pillow book continued to be viewed as Zuihitsu. It's interesting that the Zuihitsu label stayed within scholarly circles only in the Edo period. It didn't cross over to popular culture. In popular culture, the work meant a collection of lists, and we see this in various erotic parodies, in various works related to the pleasure quarters in Japan, uh, in texts for women's education, instruction manuals for women. The book is again referred to as a collection of lists. So the idea of Zuihitsu doesn't really exist there. I've examined some manga adaptations of the pillow book, especially uh, works that were created in the late 90s and in the most recent years. And what I was delighted to find out was that they don't usually talk about the pillow book as a zuihitsu, and they try to create a fuller picture of the work. So we see Sei Shonagon uh, as usually a career-driven woman, very successful. She is always presented as a divorcee. <laughs> this is also an interesting aspect. And um, the book is presented as usually a Seishanagon's success story or a story about her life. There are various reasons why manga adaptations may be viewing the text this way, but one is to make the text easily accessible to younger readers. So in my work, I place the pillow book in various contexts from the 17th century to almost the present, I examined how the book was interpreted and read by different audiences, including audiences of differing genders. And I realized that it's really unproductive to try to focus on just one manifestation of the work or to try to find which text was closest to the original and what exactly Say Shonagon wrote because the answers to these questions are not really available to us. It's really more productive to consider different manifestations of the text as part of a larger discourse and how they interacted with each other and what function they performed for the specific type of readership. I also learned that attempts to pin down a classical text to a singular meaning or a singular specific interpretation only prevents us from learning about the various functions, the text and the representations of its author have performed over the centuries for various readers.